Welcome to another episode of Culinary School Stories, the weekly podcast that is dedicated to sharing the stories of people around the globe whose lives have been influenced, impacted, touched, and or enriched, for good or for bad, from their culinary school experience. Hi, my name is Colin Roach and I'm your host. Thanks for joining us today. You are an important part of this show where we ask the question, what's your culinary school story? So now, without any further delay, let's meet today's guest. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for another episode of the Culinary School Stories podcast, a proud member of the Food Media Network. Today's guest joins us from the other side of the globe, where she has a distinguished culinary career, opening restaurants in Sri Lanka and all the way to teaching Asian cuisine to chefs in the Ukraine. And these are only part of her culinary school stories. And now it is my pleasure to introduce today's guest, Chef Marilyn Ballygod. Marilyn, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Chef. I'm uh, overwhelmed to be one of your guests. Oh, well, thank you. I know we have a lot to get to, and I want to make sure we hit it all. But let's, like any good story, let's start at the beginning. Where did your love of food come from, and what point did you realize you're going to make this into a career? Actually, it all started when I was about... Um, nine years old because my mom loves to cook and so I was always beside her like you know mom what are you doing and she was like oh just go over there and play and I was like <laughs> no I'll be here you know so she loves baking and I can still remember when I was nine she used she was using this uh, larger mania oven so I was kind of like you know like a kid very very uh curious about things, what is going on. And then I started to uh, how, learn how to cook rice from a wood fire Wow! at the age of nine. And we didn't have any electricity then. And where was this? This is in your home of Thailand? No, this is my from my hometown up north of the Philippines. Oh, okay. And so you were outside on the campfire learning how to, on the open fire, learning how to cook rice? Actually... What we did was like, you know, uh, in my where I come from, my town is that we had this we had the oven. And at the same time, we had this. Uh, I don't know how we how you call that, but we use a uh, wood fire. Mm -hmm. And there's like three stones, like the typical cooking place for all the problems. This is uh, this is outdoors, right? No, no, it's inside the house. Oh, OK. Inside. Yeah. And my dad would actually wake me up at five o'clock in the morning and you know she'll go Marilyn it's time for you to go and cook rice for your brothers and your sisters and I'm like okay <laughs> so I'm like you know and at first my my dad wanted me to be a lawyer but my dream was to be a nurse but things all didn't work out until like you know I really want to love cooking I want to I want to be in this kind of industry, you know, and then after that, I was like, I decided to go to computer school because like, you know, going to a culinary school here in the Philippines is quite expensive. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, you know, well, I'm still young, so I, I'll, I'll do something else. Then I, I had my own furniture business and then that also got me bored. I was like, maybe I should just go for it, you know. And then I'm so lucky. I could say that I'm very, very lucky that uh, I met someone. And we were actually just watching Food Network channel. <laughs> but I already love cooking, you know. So I would just watch and then I go, okay, I'll go do it. So, so every dish that I'm watching on Food Network, I'll copy it. Then it turns out to be very, very good. And then my boyfriend was like, you know, why don't you just go to culinary school? And I'm like, are you serious? I said, that's very expensive. He goes, just go, you know. So I actually went to Thailand and then my, the first, I was like looking around, you know, wandering around and I'm seeing all this culinary school, but they were only like for a few days or like a week. Oh, they're like a hob hobbyist class or something yeah. like that. Yeah, and then I came across a uh, blue elephant and then so I relate it to him that I guess no find something better and so I found the cordon bleu 
you know, and then. Wow. Yes. And then I said to him, it's very expensive. I guess just go do it. So I went for it, you know. Great. So you, you know, take you back. Your love of food really started with that, you know, necessity of cooking rice and stuff with your, with your parents and your family. But then as you grew up, they wanted you to go a different route. They wanted you to be, yeah. as you mentioned, a lawyer or a nurse. But you end up still pushing that culinary dream off and went to computer school and started businesses. Yes. And then I, later I on in life. Of, I took a couple of courses like travel and tourism. And then I went to do my, my first year in my college, where I was taking up a Bachelor of Arts and my major was political science. Mm. And so I'm like, and I, I was actually one of the scholars, you know, and then I'm like, nah, this is not what I want. <laughs> And so my dad was so disappointed at me, you know, and growing up as a kid, we used like, you know, all those uh, tin cans and then we would, I would be playing with my friends and we'll be cooking those leaves, you know, <laughs> just for an experiment, but we don't eat it. <laughs> <laughs> so the love was there yeah. all the time inside, but you just didn't explore it till later. It has always been there. And also I grew up also with my grandmother, and he had this uh, dish that I was really surprised when I was at Le Cordon Bleu, and then it was one of the dishes. It was the cassoulet. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, wow. I said this was from my grandmother's uh, recipe. Sure. You know? <laughs> so, <laughs> but without the lardon and all that, we were using this air-dried pork, mm. and, you know, you kind of like, uh, it, we call it itag, which is, uh, it was a pork belly, but you brine it with lots and lots of salt for a mm. few days, and then you air dry it. And that's what you use for sautéing vegetables and wow. making soup and everything. Yeah, so I was I was really shocked when the cassoulet came out. Yeah, it's very similar. <laughs> um, so let's go to... Cordon Bleu. You found that after looking at some of these smaller schools and you decided this is the one you're going to go to. At what age were you? Because you weren't the typical student right out of like high school at 18. I was in my early 40s. So how was that going to school with all of these younger, I'm guessing they were younger students? Well, what happened is that I actually went back to see my partner, you know, and I was like, but I already went to the school and then started asking for the requirements. So I went back and then uh, this is what the process is. Like, okay, go for it. So I went back to Thailand again and then they processed my visa. But at the same time, I was really nervous because I didn't know what I was getting myself into. So finally, I was, I enrolled and we started in January in 2011. So my first day was kind of like, you know, orientation. So we were just introducing and then there were a couple of... So uh, hold on a minute. Where was, where was the school? Was it in Thailand? Yes, this was in Thailand. So how far, how far was that from where you were living? I, I was actually in Singapore. Wow. So you had to move to go to school. Yeah. Wow. So it's a big commitment. Yeah. But I was determined. <laughs> <laughs> Plus all the money. I was money. really determined to do it. So, okay. So you, you enrolled and they accepted you. And then you moved from Singapore to Thailand to go to Cordon Bleu. Yeah. You're arriving on day one for orientation. Now take us through that part. Okay. Uh, we had a couple of international students. So there were like 44 students, including the locals. So they gave out the uniforms and you know, the knives and everything. But then the first day in class, I was just like, you know, trying to be cocky, you know. So <laughs> the chef was like talking and talking and talking and then I was not paying attention. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And then the next minute, I look around and I saw all my classmates that were writing down everything. So I'm like, oh, I better pay attention. I said, so it started with all the basic, you know, and so the next minute, the chef goes like, all right, let's go to the kitchen. And so I'm like, I'm in trouble. Because you weren't paying attention. Yeah. So I was like looking at my classmate, one of my classmates that was like right next to me. And I'm like, so I kept asking. And then he looked at me and he goes, next time you better listen. i like, okay, I'm sorry. Wow. You know? <laughs> it's serious, huh? Serious stuff. Oh, I tell you what, 
this uh, the Thai students, they were very, very competitive, but that didn't scare me. Well, now, were they, were, were they all younger than you at the time? Oh, yeah. But we had one, one student that was a lot old, older than me, and she was from France. Wow. But she was living in Thailand. Huh. So was it mostly was it mostly males or was it fe- even female males? Oh, uh, it was mixed. Mixed. Yeah. Okay, so you got into that first lab. What what happened? What were you making? What, how'd you do? We were just doing like you know soups and everything, all the basic or like you know how to do the knife skills. Mm-hmm. So I was kind of like scared because you know the knives were very very sharp. <laughs> yeah, so I'm like. Is this what I really want? Do I really want to pursue this? But, you know, seeing the other students, they were very, very serious about it. So I was like, I better get serious, you know, because like, ah, they're young. So what did what did you think it was going to be like? What did you expect? And then when you got there, it was like, whoa. I thought, I thought they were just going to be like, you know, all right, this is how to do, how to slice the onion. This is how you're going to sharpen your knives. This is how you start with making some, you know, consomme or whatever. That's a, I thought they were just, okay, here's the, the recipe. We will teach you how to cook that. I thought that was it. You thought it was slower pace? It wasn't going to go as fast as it did? or Yeah. <laughs> and so I'm like, so as we go on, everything is getting more intense. And then I found myself every weekend going to the shopping mall looking for nice plates so I can have a different plate, you know, because they were letting us use the plates from school. Mm. And then some of the students were like bringing in those very expensive plates, you know, I like, I better do the same thing, you know, (laughs) because I don't want to be left out. Right. So did they have any orientation at first to let you know what you were up against, what you were going to, what to expect when you get there? Well, at first, the orientation was actually like getting to know each other. Like, you know, you, you got to introduce yourself, you know, Mm -hmm. and there was, I remember there was one student that was, uh, who already took up pastry in France. So, oh, that's a very big, I'm like, you know, I was scared of her. <laughs> because she already had an experience of being in, in Cordon Bleu. So how did you fit in? How did you, you know, mesh with your other classmates? How did you survive? Well, what happened is that, you know, I, I like to, I started, I usually I, I sit at the back. You know, then the next day I was right in front. I I better get serious. So I'm like making notes and everything. And my head is starting to work already on how am I going to plate it? Like, you know, I I can't just copy what the chef was showing us. You know, you got to be different. Mm -hmm. And so was the and most of the locals like, you know, they they didn't speak very good English. So we had an interpreter. Oh, so they were using the plates from school and a couple of the really serious one, they go out and buy their own plates as well, just like me, you know. Yeah. And we would I would be carrying heavy plates with me, you know, going to school. Yeah. It was very, very intense. So they they, they taught all the classes in English and some of the students didn't speak English, so they had someone that would just repeat what the instructor was saying. Uh yeah, that, that we had a translator. Okay. Yeah. So that must have been a little difficult for some of those students because now it's they got it's a little bit of a delay. Yeah, it was it was an advantage for us for the international students because the chef was speaking in English. So are the chefs tough? Yeah. Are they mean? Are they good? Are they funny? Tell us about the chefs. What was your impression of the chefs? Uh, I don't have to name him. Okay. You don't have to. <laughs> First one was really mean. Wow. He's he's local. So he was from Thailand, and he was a Thai chef. So he was the first chef that you go to your first class, and you think he was mean. How why, how was he mean? Tell tell the listeners that don't understand culinary school what it's like, what they're going to go through, what they may see. Yeah. They would give you the recipe, right? And then you do all the measurements and everything. And after cooking the dish that he wants us to cook, we would present it to him. Then he goes, oh, there's not much salt. There's not much this. There's not much that. And so I'm like scratching my head and I'm going like, but we did the measurement. This is your recipe, you know, that I would be talking to the other students. Ah, you know what chefs are like. They want, it's either less or more. And there was one time when 
we were at the practical and, you know, one of the bowls, I think we were whisking something and then I took it like this, holding it like that. And like, you know, I was copying my mom. Whisking it in your arms? Yes. I was copying my mom. Uh And then he yelled at me. So I'm like, okay, I'm sorry, chef. I was like, no, you don't do that in the kitchen. I said, okay. I mean, you learn from your mistake. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's why you're in school, right? Yeah, I mean, it was my, <laughs> I didn't know how everything works in, in the culinary school. So, you know, after that, then he he was keeping an eye on me all the time. Wow. Yeah, so I'm like, I think this chef doesn't like me, you know. So Were you a troubled student, did he think? Yeah, probably, yeah. Or maybe like, you know, I wasn't the oldest because there was another one who was the, there was another one over there. Actually, there's another one from Denmark, I think, who was into banking, and then he went to culinary school. Wow. Yeah, and, you know, it's either, or every time I present my dish, it's either not very good or less of this, or you need to add more of that. So when we had, when we ended up the first term, from 44 to 44 students, I was number 25. Out of 44, they all dropped out, a lot of them? No, Chef. I mean, like, you know, because they always have this uh, graduation, like, you know, because there were three terms, basic, intermediate, and uh, superior. Okay. So my basic, I was only the number, uh, the 25th student out of 44. So I'm like, wow, he doesn't really like me, Mm. you know? (laughs) So, well, there was worse. There was someone was worse than you, right? Yeah. Well, but I was like, you know, I want. I was very competitive. You know, I wanted to be at least on top five. You know, but why do you think that is? Did you think they sensed that you weren't? They thought you weren't serious, or they weren't? You weren't grasping it, or they were trying to push you out? Oh, probably, probably, yeah. Because I was always joking. You know, like I need to to be relaxed. You know, I mean, if you're relaxed of of what you're doing, then the outcome would be a lot better instead of just, you know, you're, you're so tense, then mm-hmm. you're just going to mess everything up, you know? So I was, there was a time when uh, he asked us to to be in a group of three, so three students each, and I was so unlucky, like, because we have to debone the whole piglet. Wow. And the other, the other two... The other one was gay, and the other one was Muslim. So I got to do everything. So I'm like, you know, okay, guys, I'm mean, like, you know, I'll just do everything and just prepare, just do all the measurements for the ingredients, for the ingredients that we need, then I'll just do it, you know, so. Because the, the Muslim didn't want to go near the pork at all, right? Well, yeah, I can understand, but the other students... And it, the other student was like nothing, but he was just going like this with his face, you know, patting all his face all the time. I'm like, hey, listen, I said, you're going to, you need to help. You know, it's like, oh, no. <laughs> it's like, I don't want to deal with that. I was like, okay, that's fine. I'll do it. Too much drama for him. He didn't want to touch the pig. It was gross or something. Yeah, because it was still, you know, bloody and everything. But we we already, we dealt the head already. So it was left to you to f- fabricate the piglet. Yes, everything. But it was fun. <laughs> and how did that how did that go? What did the what did the chef say? What was their critique? Well, the chef was like, "Who did this?" So I was like, and then they were they were pointing at me. The two students were <laughs> yeah, they were pointing at me, and then I was like, "No, we did it all." They threw you under the bus. No, but came out very good. I mean, the the result was very nice. Oh, but he can see that I was doing all the work because I didn't want to take all the credit, you know, because. They're in my team. So I told the chef that, oh, we, we did it all. And so he kind of like loosened up a little bit with me. Ah. Yeah. So did the your second class get better? Were you better at it by then? And how was that chef? The, the intermediate one was a lot better. He's French. And he's always joking with me, you know. And from 25th, I became the number, I came top five. Wow. Good for you. Yeah. So that was a better that is a better segment for you, better module, better. Yes, it was a better. It was a very good segment. I mean, like during the finals, I actually I was actually one of the top three best dishes from all the forty four students. Wow. Yeah. So I was like, well, I guess this is the outcome. 
<laughs> How many people finished? You said they started with 44 at the end of the program. was Did everybody get through? Did people drop out? Uh, some of the students dropped out because they couldn't take the, the pressure. But I was not looking into dropping out. Dropping out was not the option for me. Not at all. <laughs> right. You had a big, you know, a big commitment already, right? You already yes. moved there, you, the tuition. So, yeah. you know, you, it's a lot to lose. Yeah. And the thing is, like, you know, they said that we were not, actually, it's not allowed to wear your uniform going home and even the shoes, your chef shoes. Hmm. You have to leave it, you know, leave your, sh- uh, your chef shoes in your locker. But the uniform, you got to take it off before going home. Oh, and wash it and bring it back. Yeah, wash it and bring it back. And then I got caught one time. Wearing it? <laughs> well, I went, I was wearing it going home. How'd they catch you? And then one of the chef was actually behind me. What'd they say? I got cold. Did they, how'd they reprimand you? What'd they do? To say, don't do that? Or? Yeah, they told me that uh, it is not allowed that you'll be, we've already told you about this in the very beginning, that you are not allowed to be wearing your uniform on the way home and even why is that why was why did they have that rule it's probably they probably didn't want anyone to know that everyone was going to this school but you know what i don't understand is that they should be proud that they have all these students all over you know but we were not allowed sure it's like marketing it's like advertising it shows off the school other people will be interested and maybe want to check it out yeah that was i i've found it very strange, you know. Maybe it was a sanitation thing. They didn't want people going and getting dirty or I, I don't know. Probably, yeah. But we were not allowed to wear uniforms going to school as well. So, you know, we, we got everything all folded up, then go to your locker and then wear your uniform. What did they have, like a changing room, locker room that you change into yeah. when you got there and lock up your stuff? Yeah, they were pretty strange. How big was the school? It was pretty big. Because it was, uh, they had the section for pastry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there were a lot of students taking pastry. So what advice would you give to someone that was like you? Maybe someone that wasn't a typical student, a little bit older, a female wants to go to culinary school. What advice, the, you know, the pitfalls that you found, what would, what would you advise them to do and, and be ready? Well, what I can advise them is that don't go in there like, you know, everything, you know, just go with the flow, take your observation, you know, and keep your feet on the ground. Don't pretend that, you know, I'm better than the other students because you never know who you, you're going to meet. Mm-hmm. Just take it seriously. If you have, I mean, do not go to a culinary school just to get a degree or so you can get a job. I mean, like you better make sure that that's what you love doing because being a chef, you have to, have the passion, you know, you can, uh, as we all know, when you're cooking and you're angry, the food doesn't come out very good. Yeah. yeah. So all I can say is that take, take things seriously, you know, but you don't have to be aggressive. Just be very serious of what you do. Like, you know, when you go in, listen, you know, and ex- execute properly instead of just, you know, don't rely on other people because your success, you have got to make it your own by your own. Mm-hmm. Don't rely on other students because you will be left behind. Because at first I was like that. I was so cocky. <laughs> I can't do that. I mean, as a, as a newbie, you go in there. Take it seriously. Make sure you have the passion. Be humble. Be ready to learn. Yeah. Be ready to take criticism. You know, constructive criticism is always normal because you cannot please everyone. So, and do not copy. Be, try to be creative. Good advice. Uh, now that you have perspective, you can look back on it. Was it worth it? Would you do it again? Would you do any changes? Oh, yeah. I would do it again. Really? Yeah. I mean, I kind of like miss, you know, I miss the school because it gives you all this inspiration. Like, you know, you would, I mean, you wouldn't just go to school and like, yeah, okay, this is what I want to do. But then at the end, you're not going to do it. You're not going to take it seriously. You know. Mm-hmm. Now let's talk about you being a teacher. So now that you've been on the, you know, the shoe was on the other foot, and you were in front of the class teaching those students in Ukraine, maybe other places. How did you? Well, actually, it was I was working. I was a sous chef in one of the restaurants in uh, 
in Sri Lanka, in Colombo. It was a pre, pre-opening and my head chef was uh, from Malaysia. And it so happened that, you know, the, the head chef's day off is Sunday. So I was the one in charge. Mm-hmm. And we were covering like 250 reservations for four hours. And there were a group of chef from uh, Ukraine, from Lviv. And they spotted me and... They said, can we get your Facebook? I said, yeah, sure, no problem. And then they were taking pictures with me, you know, and then all of a sudden they left. And then I got a message from them, said, we would like to hire you to come and teach uh, the Ukrainian chef about uh, Asian cuisine. I was like, oh, wow. I said, I was really surprised. But at the same time, I was proud, you know, that when you are working and you, when you're doing something and, and it's being appreciated by these foodies, you know? Yeah, they recognize it. Yeah. The skill. Yeah, and then actually they put us, me and the head chef, we were in a, in a newspaper in Colombo. So did they fly, they fly you to Ukraine to teach the chefs? Yeah. Actually, I finished my, uh, my contract with this restaurant and then I told them that, look, you know, my, my contract is going to be finished, then I can't just fly from Colombo direct to Ukraine. You know, I got to go home because that's where I, they're going to process my visa. So I came back here and then they were processing. It took about at least a month to process the visa. And then I went over there and then from very warm, very hot weather to a very cold weather, yeah. it was a big shock for me. And I had fun in Ukraine. It was a it was a ski resort, and they had forty seven restaurants. And I was really surprised because the head chef over there was uh, is from uh, Korea, but he was born in uh, Ukraine. Mm. But I met him. But I already met him in Colombo, and so I met him over there. And then, you know, I got introduced to everyone. So, you know, I was teaching them how to do Asian cuisine. And they were all like laughing because, you know, the terms of the dishes, they just couldn't understand. Right, right. So tell me about that from that teaching perspective, because you, when you were a student, the chefs were thinking that maybe you were not paying attention or that you were whatever. Now you're the instructor. How was it teaching those chefs? Was it hard? Did you, how do you get your point across? How did you become a great instructor so you could get the message through? It was... Uh, It was kind of hard in the beginning because there was only one chef who can understand what I was saying Mm. because most of them, they didn't speak English, but like, you know, I'm doing the sign language. And so it was actually fun. You know, I think teaching students is fun as long as you don't have the the language barrier. Mm -hmm. You know, as, as long as you speak the same language, then it's fine. But teaching people who doesn't speak very good English, then it's kind of hard, you know, and it it took me, I was teaching them for like three weeks and I was really proud of them because they were very quick learners, very, very quick learners. Very good. So let's change gears here. Who is your favorite chef? Who? (laughs) I I really love Jada Laurentiis Mm -hmm. and Guy Fieri. Oh really? Yes. So you follow them on the on the TV and their shows and videos. Yeah, I mean, the reason why I like them is because they're fun to watch. You know, instead of just you know getting so serious about you know the way they are doing their job. You know, just like Gordon Ramsay when he starts yelling. You know. <laughs> <laughs> you don't like that. I was like that at one stage. Yeah. Yeah, my last assignment in. Uh, Sri Lanka again because I went there twice. I I had two restaurant pre opening, so I told the guy to get out. You fired him? Well, no, I told the management to move him to the production kitchen. Wow, no good. No, he was bad. He was. So what are you doing? What are you doing now? What are you? What is your plans? What are you? What do you see yourself? Ne- what's next for you? For I want to get myself into. The cruise ship, but over here in the Philippines, they have issues when it comes to age, you know. And I'm like, there is, you know, the people over here, they need to know 
that being a chef, there's no such thing as age limit. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason why they say they say that is because probably because the younger ones are like, you know, get lower pay Mm -hmm. than the experienced one. So I guess that's probably, you know, one of the reasons why. And I actually just finished my uh, basic training, which is one of the prerequisite for working on a ship or working on a yacht. And actually, I have about three weeks ago, I had a call from one of the maritime agency and they're dealing with yachts. So I already forgot all about that, you know, I because I applied to them about two years ago. And, and I only got a call from them about three weeks ago. And then they said they wanted me to update my certificates because they, they they're going to start hiring. Mm. And then I said, when I asked her, I said, do you have any age limit? And then the person that I, I was talking to, she gave me high hopes because she was actually the one who told me that in our industry, there is no such thing as age limit when being a chef, as long as you're passionate about your job. So I'm, I'm really, really thankful. So I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. And in some countries, it's illegal, like the United States. Yeah. You can't have age discrimination. So it's like, you know, it's hire the best person for the job, regardless of their gender or their age or, you know, mm-hmm. religious beliefs, any of that type of stuff. Are you finding that as you're looking for work? Are you finding that age is a you know, detrimental for your for your search, for you getting employment? Well, it is kind of like not fair when it comes to our industry because if you were to hire someone and you're the owner, would you rather hire someone who doesn't know what he's doing in the kitchen or someone who's experienced? You know, because for me, I mean, okay, fine, we can uh, teach the skills, but attitude that's a big no no because a lot of youngsters right i mean i don't have anything against all these youngsters you know but you know sometimes when they think that they are better than the ones who have experience mm-hmm. and that is a big problem so that is why i refuse to be to apply for a job over here because i'm going to get turned down anyways so it's kind of like just a waste of time mm. what about what about being a female? Do you find that that's a detriment too? Do you, do you think they look different at males? It is detrimental in uh, some other countries because they think that females don't belong in a commercial kitchen. Wow. Yeah, because that's what happened. I had a problem with that in Sri Lanka the first time when I when we when I was a sous chef over there. Uh, me and the head chef we were in one of the properties of this uh, restaurant. And we were doing our preparation over there. And then most of them, uh, well, they were all male chef in that uh, resort. And then one of them came up to me and he was like, he was mean to me and telling me that, you know, you shouldn't be here. And so I looked at him and I'm like, do you even know who you are talking to? I said to him, so I'm like, you know, you shouldn't be, you shouldn't have a problem about female being in a kitchen. I think he was intimidated because I had a higher position and he didn't. And also we were foreigners. And so I told, I turned around and I told him that, you know, you shouldn't be talking to me like that. Yeah. You should be talking to the owner because I didn't bring myself over here. I was brought here, you know. True. So if the owner didn't believe in me, then I wouldn't be here. And so I told, I confronted the owner. I told him that, you know, your chef in that resort, they didn't want us, you know, especially me, I said. So you have, you have firsthand experience then of harassment in the industry from past jobs and employer, employees. I did when I was in, in Thailand and also in uh, Dubai. When I was in Thailand, <laughs> it's so funny how this, owners they think that you know when they see a female chef you know i the owner was coming in the kitchen every morning and start rubbing my back that i'm like excuse me i said please stop doing that and then he started cutting my salary and so he didn't want to give it back to me why because he was he wanted you to be like a girlfriend more than an employee well he already his girlfriend was there in the restaurant he was, she was in the bar and then he would come 
in a kitchen. Then he would start rubbing my back. Then I was like, please don't do that. You know, let's just be professional or I will poke you with my knife. <laughs> I said to him, as a joke, you know. Yeah, yeah. And so he actually stopped doing that one. And uh, he's, he's, a, he's actually French who was like, you know, his business was failing. And then this was in Phuket and he was only having like, three or five tables every night and wow. you know he was yeah so he was in a mall that it was pretty big and uh the capacity was uh 120 so yeah he was failing yeah so i just finished my internship and he hired me and then i went over there and said i said no wonder why nobody was coming to your restaurant i said because everything was frozen even the sauce the, the dipping sauce, the soup, and everything were, were all pre-made. Yeah. And everything was frozen. And then they they just blast it on in the microwave. And I'm like, you are right next to a fresh market. Why did you let your chef do this to your business? And then when I took over, he was like, you know, he was so happy because they were like, we were getting lot, lots and lots of covers because I was cooking fresh seafood. Everything was fresh instead of just, you know. Sure. Frozen processed garbage. <laughs> yeah. But I kind of like gave up on him because he was cutting off my salary. You cut your pay. My Yeah. He was cutting off my pay. Wow. And then I said, why are you doing this? I said, and then he goes, oh, th this is for security reasons. I mean, like, I just want to make sure that uh, you're coming back to work. I was like, I'm coming. I've been coming back to work every freaking day. I said, you take my pay. I'm not coming back. <laughs> yeah. And then, so what happened is that we had an event. It was a musical event in the restaurant and it was booked for 80 people. I shouldn't have done it, but I did it because I was upset. You know, I mean, you don't do things to other people if you don't want them to do the same thing unto you, you know, so 80 people or uh, 70 people. It was all my recipe. <laughs> And then it was December 6th. The event was December 6th. December, December 5th, I took off. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that was, I was feeling guilty. I was feeling very, very guilty. That was very unprofessional, but... They pushed you to that, though, right? Yeah, he did. Now, going back to that, though, be, that harassment, how, how would you advise, though? Because we have listeners now that are listening, young females, girls, maybe getting into this industry. What would you tell them? What, what should they do when, that, when they find themselves in similar situations or that's happening to them? Do you have any advice? I mean, uh, for young female chefs, especially from, I shouldn't be saying the countries, but I'm pretty sure that it's already well known, like, you know, in the Whatever. It's, it's your experience, though. So, you know, you say the countries, it's, you know, it's what you've, what you've found. Yeah. It's my experience in the Middle East, like, you know, uh, my advice to these uh, young female chefs when they go, when they go and find a job in the Middle East, you know, they have to be very, very careful because when you're applying for a job, just be very upfront to them, like, you know, be very, very careful because sometimes when they are advertising job, they are actually looking for girlfriends or it's not a real job because that's what happened to me. Like, you know, I was, uh, and actually the head, the executive chef was an American, American guy. He was black. And I was still working at Eric Kaiser as a demi chef. And so, because I wanted to grow. So I started looking for a different workplace. Like, mm -hmm. you know, my advice to these young chefs is that if you think that you're not growing, then you, you talk to, the head chef or the executive chef or the HR. And if you are not happy, don't just stay there just for, for the sake of getting paid. You gotta be you also have to be happy where you're where you're working at. Yeah, you gotta build your career. So you're always trying to advance and move up. Yeah, you gotta build your career. And he was it turned out that he wasn't actually looking for a chef. He was looking for a girlfriend. Wow, how did he advertise for that? Did he send out an ad or something? He was he advertised he was advertising on a paper and on online. So I went over there and then it turned I had the interview and then it What did he say? Did he say like a female chef I'm looking for in the ad or was it just a chef and hoping that a female would apply? No, it's just a chef. Okay. It was just a chef and then you know Coming from the benefit of being from a uh, from a 
well-known culinary school and it's actually an advantage because everyone is trying to really lean into their team because oh she graduated from CIA or uh, Cordon Bleu or you know mm -hmm. and that's what happened he called me up during uh, on my day off and he goes can you come for an interview and I thought he was a local executive chef but he was actually from the U.S. and it turned out that the interview was not really an interview but it was getting to know each other wow so I was like, you know, uh, this is not right because I'm actually looking for a job and not for a boyfriend or whatever. And they should always like, you know, uh, the, young, the young female chef, when they go for an interview in the Middle East, they should always be with someone else. Because where was this one? Was this one like at their property, at their restaurant? Or did they meet you at a you know, cafe or someplace? Uh, some of, some of the, the, the some of the places that I went to were... Uh, they would ask you to go to their house. If it's their house, don't go. It has to be in the restaurant. But some of the restaurants, you know, they have they have a separate HR office, but it was in a remote area. So don't go there. Mm -hmm. But if you do, if you do end up going, you always have to be with someone else, especially in the Middle East. Yeah, that's with red flags. So when he interviewed you, he called you up to meet with you. You're thinking, okay, here's my resume. I'm going for this job. I want to see if I'll pay. And then all of a sudden, how? Yeah, I was, I was prepared. How do you know? What at what point did you realize? Uh oh, this is this is not legit. This is this is crazy. Uh, after showing me the kitchen, he was like, uh, "You, this is where," he, because he already told me that I'm going to hire you, so I'm going to show you the kitchen. He said, "Okay," and then uh, after showing me the kitchen, uh, we went out, and then he goes can you please give me your number? And I'm like, why are you asking for my number? It's already on my resume, I said. And so, oh, okay, I'll just give you a call. He said, and then I was uh, on duty at work and then I got a message from him. He goes, what time are you finishing? Then I'm like, I'm I'm always a closing person. You know, I got to close everything. I got to make sure that everything is clean and everything. He goes, all right, I'll come and pick you up. And this was like uh, about two o'clock in the morning. Wow. Yeah, because I was on a night shift. But you're like, why? Why do you want to pick me up? I mean, who? <laughs> yeah. Doesn't make any sense, right? In your mind, you're like, what? Yeah, exactly. And then, like you know, we usually close the restaurant, the kitchen at eleven, eleven thirty. And then uh, I gotta stay be just to make sure that. You know, mm -hmm. I'm always the last one to close everything anyway. Right. You know, I got to make sure that everything is clean. So I don't get home till like three o'clock in the morning with the, we have our own service in the, at, from the, from the mall. And he's like, you know, I'll come and pick you up. You don't have to do the service because, you know, uh, it's dangerous and the way they are driving, which is really true. They were driving like mad people, but I was like, where are you get? Where are you going in in this conversation? I was like, you know, no, I just want to get to know you. And I'm like, are you trying to give me the job, or are you trying to kiss my ass, or what is it? You know. And then it's like, oh, I actually like you, you know. And I'm like, listen, I was like, I am sorry, but this is not working out. So please stop. Right. Yeah, they crossed the line there. Yeah, he crossed the line and. It was Ramadan, and we were having problems uh, finding our transportation, you know, because they all have to fast and everything. Mm -hmm. And so he was like, I'll come and pick you up. There's no uh, there's no lift for you and everything. I said, no, I'll be fine. I said, you know, and he didn't stop for like a month until I ended up reporting him. And so he got, I think he got kicked out of uh I don't know what happened to him, but he just kind of like disappeared. Well, that's the best thing in this country is go to human resources and, you know, and make a report about that. And because it's inappropriate and it's unprofessional. But like you bring up some good points. The laws are different all around the world. So yeah. if someone's going to go on an internship from this country or study abroad or go work other places, just know that it's not the same laws, rules as it may be in your home country. Yeah, that that is why I mean, like for the female chefs, especially when they're young, because they're kind of like, uh, you know, going into that place, you know, they're kind of like, 
putting their self as a bait sometimes because uh, I don't know what is it in, in the Middle East, but it seems like, you know, because there's a lot of Filipino workers over there. You know, I have nothing against the country, but it's just they just have to be very, very careful on who they uh, who, who are they dealing with, you know, and they have to have uh, an open mind. You know, they have to be ready of embracing this kind of culture. And if they are not ready, then I would suggest they shouldn't go there. Yeah, don't be don't be naive, you know, bring in your innocence in there. Yeah. Just know that there's some there's bad actors. They have yeah, they have to study everything before going over there. Don't just go there so you can just get a job and then you're putting yourself into a situation where you're gonna, you know, regret everything. I mean, try to go to New Zealand or the US or like, you know, for especially for these youngsters who are just going to graduate, I would suggest they would uh, do their internship like your country or Australia or some or Switzerland or mm -hmm. France or things like that, mm -hmm. you know, because they actually take you seriously as an intern instead of, I mean, you do your research before stepping into this kind of places or this kind of country sure. instead of just going over there without doing your research. It, it's, it's tough out there. So if, if someone wanted to get in touch with you, I mean, first, are you open to that? And if two, how would they find you, like through social media or something, if they wanted to ask you questions or if they wanted to follow your path or your career or something? Yeah, they can. They can actually, I have my Facebook, I have my Instagram and my LinkedIn profile. I'm, I'm, I'm open. Well, that's good. So those, those links of yours, I can put those in the show notes. So if someone wants to reach out to you for advice, but also we have a lot of, you know, private yachts and stuff in this country, and maybe someone's looking for a chef and they could reach out to you as well. So yeah, sure. Not a problem. I would be, I would really appreciate that one chef. So uh, after looking back on your education, Cordon Bleu, is there anything that you wish that you had learned that you didn't? Anything that they should have taught that you thought that, you know, would have been valuable? Uh, yeah, there is. Uh, they should uh, teach the, the students how to do costing and everything because they didn't teach that. Wow. Yeah. Uh, the reason why I call it intense is because, like, you go in, you pay attention on what the, the, the chef instructor was uh, executing. Then you go into the kitchen, you execute, uh, you got to execute the same thing, hmm. you know. But when it comes to costing and all that, that's what they didn't teach. Wow. That's so important, too, to be a chef. You got to know. Yes. I mean, it's I, very, very important. I teach cost control at, at universities that I work at, and I always tell them, you could be the you could be the best chef in the world and still go broke if you don't know how to make money. <laughs> yeah, that that's the only thing, you know. I mean, pretty much about executing in the kitchen is fine, but when it comes to paperwork, they should start teaching that one, like wow. costing and everything. Yeah. I know that's a tough subject for a lot. I have a YouTube channel and I put a costing video on there and I think it has 140 or 150,000 views and people are like, this is so helpful. And I'm like, how could they be chefs or running businesses and don't really know how to cost? So yeah. you know, it's just amazing that some people don't have that part of knowledge when they get out of culinary school or culinary training. I was, it was actually funny because when I was working in Dubai, there was this, my, my head chef was like, he came, he turned around and then he goes, do you know anything about costing? So that's the time when I went, it clicked and I was, they hired me as a demi chef, you know, but as a demi chef, you don't really do the costing because it has, it, it, that, that is the top level who's doing the costing, you know, so I'm like, I went into the bookstore and started looking for this book for costing because I wanted to learn. Sure. You know, I mean, as a chef, you never stop learning. So that's the only regret. You know, that's the only thing. You think that, and you, you think that job was hiring you because of the costing? You think that was the valuable piece that separated you? I think so, yeah. Every every chef, they, they should learn how to do the costing. Mm-hmm. Because there's a lot of chef who doesn't know how to do that. That's true. I mean, I'm still struggling up to now. You know, when you go to different countries, they would ask you to do the costing. And you, you, you're you going to struggle because you don't know how much these things would cost. Mm -hmm. So true. 
So you have to have a connection with the vendors or your suppliers and learn their prices. And then that's the time how you're going to adjust with the costing. Well, I, I have something for you. I just finished. It hasn't even been announced yet. I just finished a free course on recipe costing. Oh, wow. So I will put that, I will send it to you separately. And I also, for the listeners, I will include it in the show notes. So you can click on it. It's a free course. It's only a few hours, but it does go through the cost card and teach about, you know, Q factors and food costs. So, uh, Oh, thank you, Chef. Thank you so much. <laughs> no problem. But culinary school was, sounds like it was really transformational for you. From that first day when you got in there and you weren't even paying attention to now you're in the top three in your class. I mean, what a yeah. big turn of events, huh? Yeah, it was. I was I was actually proud of myself. Good, yeah. And uh, as we come to the end of our chat today, and before we wrap up, is there any last-minute advice or guidance you want to leave with the listeners, something you want to share? In my own opinion, I mean, like, you got to love what you do. But at the same time, you also have to learn to have fun and not just don't wait for yourself to drop in the kitchen until someone replaces you. I mean, I know that be, uh, being in the kitchen or being a chef, we don't get much time to have fun because we're always working, working, working and working. Mm -hmm. But uh, you got to just like what I said before, you got to love what you do. You got to love being in the kitchen and be ready especially when you start working in a very fast-paced environment. You can't just stand there and just go, what am I doing over here? So just be honest, just keep on learning. Mm -hmm. You know, you got uh, to keep on learning. You don't just stay there. If you think that you're not learning anything, talk to somebody else, you know, or do some reading, you know, learn from someone who is really an expert. You know, because me, myself, I may have graduated from one of the top culinary school in the world, but, you know, I'm still learning and I want to keep learning. Just keep on doing that. Move forward. Don't just it, we all make mistakes and learn from your mistakes. You know, no one is perfect in the kitchen and work wise. Just be professional. Don't give in into something that would get yourself into trouble. Or don't be a snake, don't be a snitch, just be honest, you know, don't put your co-workers or your colleagues into trouble so you can get to a higher level. Just be professional. Great advice. Well, that is just about all the time we have for this episode. I want to first thank you, Marilyn, for coming on the show today and sharing your culinary school story with all of us. We really appreciate your time and your insight and your honesty. Uh, it's my honor, Chef, for inviting me over here. I'm really, really happy that I could share my story and give advice to the younger chef. And I look forward to anyone who would like to contact me and ask for more advice. Thank you so much, Chef. Oh, thank you. Thanks again. And I really enjoyed our chat. Bye-bye now. Thank you, Chef. Bye. And a big thanks and appreciation also goes out to all of you, the listeners. We hope you enjoy the show and this episode. You all are a big part of this show, so please let us know what you think. Your comments are always welcome, and they help us in making the best show possible. You can email them to culinaryschoolstories at gmail.com. That's culinaryschoolstories at gmail.com. Or even leave us a voicemail at area code 207-835-1275. That's area code 207-835-1275. And if you like the show, we have a big ask of all of you. And that is to share the podcast with everyone you know. And to give us a positive rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Okay, until our next culinary school story, take care and be well. Bye-bye. Culinary School Stories is a proud member of the Food Media Network.